And we're back with our third installment of Heroes and Villains. So, minor hiccup in the second installment by making Noam Chomsky, a personal intellectual hero of mine, the first to represent the hero segment, as it was revealed a couple of weeks ago after I posted the video, that my man was literally a friend of Jeffrey Epstein. How's that for timing? He's literally 96 years old. You'd figure I was in pretty safe territory, right? Oh, well. 99 and I have gone over this enough in the podcast, and I'm not throwing out his work. I'm not canceling him as an intellectual giant, just expressing my profound disappointment. But hey, maybe the subject of this week's episode will also have a change of heart and stop being such a prick. Maybe I have some sort of magical power. Anyway, this week's villain is none other than PayPal co-founder, Facebook angel investor, and titular head of the billionaire libertarian movement, Peter Thiel. UNFTR. So what has Mr. Thiel done with his life to make him so deserving of this acknowledgement? We actually covered Thiel in an extensive podcast episode that I'll link in the notes. Ever since then, he's been pretty busy. The intelligence and data peddling company Palantir, the firm he co-founded, recently shot up in valuation after announcing it was infusing AI into its platform to help win more wars. He just convinced his PayPal buddy David Sachs to join the board of Rumble, the conservative online platform that just purchased a podcast streaming service to expand its reach of free speech. Teal is a key investor in Rumble. And apropos of the Chomsky revelations, it was just reported that Teal also appears several times on Jeffrey Epstein's calendar. Oh, and he wants to cryogenically freeze himself so he can live forever. And he's already doing it with pets. I'm not kidding. So what's the deal with Peter Thiel? Thiel is a master of the universe type who believes he's somehow been ordained with gifts from on high, as evidenced by his disdain for all things fair. Democracy, multiculturalism, equity and inclusion, taxes, you name it. And if you're not at all interested in learning about yet another rich, tax-evading libertarian jerk hell-bent on destroying democracy, I'll save you some time and give you the punchline. Tio is a sociopathic man-child who partakes in fiscal and political filial cannibalism. There has always been a case to be made that billionaires, simply by their very existence and their sheer lobbying power, pose a threat to democracy. But how about a proudly pro-Trump billionaire who spends his millions funding candidates who push the big lie, who invites to dinner a self-identified white nationalist and who has said on the record he doesn't believe in democracy? How about him? Shouldn't we be paying more attention to a billionaire like Peter Thiel? Yes, Mehdi, we should. Dark money is leveraged almost evenly on both sides of the political aisle. But only Republicans seem to raise money from billionaires who have designs on tearing down the political system and clearing a path for tax evasion and financial corruption. Even though there are other billionaires who have put their money into play and unabashedly support conservative ideals, Thiel has emerged as something different altogether. Piazza Thiel was born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1968 to a very Christian family. He spent some of his early years in Cleveland. Hello, Cleveland! That makes sense. Where his father, Klaus, landed a job in engineering, specializing in oil refineries and heavy industries. A few years later, his father moved the family to apartheid South Africa, where Peter would get his formative education in an elite whites-only school. His father would then switch from consulting oil companies to uranium mining in Namibia on behalf of the South African government. What a swell family. As biographer Max Chafkin writes in The Contrarian, quote, Klaus's company was helping to oversee workers who had not been told they were building a uranium mine and were thus unaware of the risks of radiation. The only clue had been that white employees would hand out wages from behind glass, seemingly trying to avoid contamination themselves. The report mentioned workers, quote, dying like flies in 1976 while the mine was under construction, end quote. The Teals moved back to Cleveland for a cup of coffee after the mine opened, but then landed in California, overseeing the opening of a gold mine. Peter read Tolkien, enjoyed Dungeons and Dragons, played chess obsessively, had very few friends, and signed every yearbook with, have a good life. You dick. Peter proved to be an exceptional student, which earned him a spot at Stanford, where he rocked a 4.0. While he was still painfully antisocial, he joined the college Republicans, started reading Ayn Rand, and apparently told classmates that, quote, concern about apartheid was overblown. 
Outside of chess and developing an early affinity for white supremacy, Thiel had a devout Christian upbringing. Although he appeared to be unmoved by religion until he became enamored with the teachings of René Girard, a philosopher who maintained that Christ was the ultimate scapegoat of history and that humans are driven by envy to imitate what they saw before them. Under Girard's influence, Thiel would rekindle his relationship with his religion and lean hard into the conservative aspects of Christianity. To this day, he has the ability to move seamlessly between lessons from Tolkien fantasy and those found in the Bible, often quoting both in public lectures. During his time at Stanford, he started the Stanford Review, modeled closely after the Dartmouth Review, which was founded by another hard-right libertarian douche nozzle named Dinesh D'Souza. And if you don't know him, look him up. He's awful. But it was his publication of a book called The Diversity Myth, which blamed women for rape and contained homophobic sentiments that earned him his first bit of notoriety. After graduation, he was accepted into Stanford Law, where he flourished academically as well. Armed with a law degree, he took a job at a white shoe firm in New York, but he didn't last very long. He quickly left the law behind and became a derivatives trader, but was uninspired and unhappy in the job. So Teal packed up, left New York, and headed back to the West Coast to start a hedge fund. Because why not? Unfortunately, the hedge fund also tanked. But he still had some money left over from family and investors, so he switched from hedge fund to venture capital. And this time, things worked out a little better. Just another made it from nothing, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps story that libertarians love so much. Of course, this assumes that you're a huge fan of apartheid, have the family support to get two advanced degrees, and the ability to leave three different professions while getting bankrolled with a million bucks. Anyway, as fate would have it, Thiel did hit the next one out of the park by investing in a little piece of technology created by a kid named Max Levkin. Levkin was a coder who programmed a way to pass information securely between Palm Pilots. Levkin called it Fieldlink. Fieldlink moved into Confinity, and Thiel took the helm when he invested $250,000 left over from his failed hedge fund. Confinity became PayPal. Quote, in its earliest days, PayPal employed no women, and there were no black employees. Years later, Levkin would boast about rejecting a candidate who used the word hoops instead of saying basketball, end quote. Teal wasn't the only white dude who grew up in South Africa running a payment company with a bunch of tech bros. In fact, the other one was literally right next door, and it was called X.com, run by a fellow named Elon Musk. While this makes for fun storytelling, here's the upshot. Initially, the two companies weren't even aware of one another, even though they were literally in buildings right next door and shared a dumpster. Both platforms were free and signing up users like crazy, but they were burning cash. Teal struck a partnership with eBay and Musk was giving the platform away as fast as possible, but the dot-com bubble was about to burst. So the two companies who were finally aware of one another merged and raised a hundred million dollars before the bottom fell out of the market. As soon as the market cratered, Teal quiet quit his own company and left Musk to pick up the pieces. He's gone. So I'm not going to rehash how PayPal ultimately grew and bankrolled its investors and gave rise to the so-called PayPal mafia in Silicon Valley. But there's one quick note that speaks to character. Musk continued to build PayPal in Teal's absence, ignoring money launderers and fraudsters in the platform, of course. It was also still bleeding cash, but it became too big to ignore because its strategy was just to give away the technology. And here's the upshot. Elon was a disaster as the CEO, but he was also a workaholic. So when he took his very first vacation in years, Thiel stepped back in, organized a coup that threw Musk out and installed himself back at the helm with a plan to go public. Playing everyone against one another, Thiel brought the IPO across the finish line, but not before making one last strategic move on the chessboard. He forced the board to part with more equity at the 11th hour, which they reluctantly awarded him through a loan to purchase more shares. And then he did something so crafty that even I have to give it a tip of the old cap. Quote, the late Senator William Roth Jr., a Delaware Republican, pushed through a law establishing the Roth IRA in 1997 to allow hardworking middle-class Americans to stow money away tax-free for retirement. The Clinton administration didn't want to give a fat tax break to wealthy people who were likely to save anyway, so it blocked Americans making more than $110,000, $160,000 for a couple, per year 
from using them and capped annual contributions back then at $2,000." End quote. That's the lead to a ProPublica article on Peter Thiel's ingenious move. When Thiel forced the board's hand to give him the money to purchase shares in the PayPal IPO, he used $500,000 in his Roth IRA to purchase more. There were three important devices that allowed him to do this. One, you cannot use Roth IRA money to purchase shares in a company you control. He didn't have control of PayPal, just a stake. Two, it had to be valued under a certain amount which it was, since this was pre-IPO. And three, you have to be a real douchebag, which he is. Essentially, all the gains of the shares of stock from that point forward grew inside the Roth account. And Teal can extract these gains tax-free when he turns 59. He's only a couple of years away. Teal would repeat this maneuver over his career, as would many others when Congress relaxed the rules on contributions even further. According to ProPublica, at the end of 2019, Teal's Roth IRA was valued at $5 billion. We're all just pawns on Peter's board. There are key elements in Teal's origin story that are essential to his character. Most of the bios and the wiki entries are consumed with his investment prowess and now his political interventions. Teal would indeed go on to provide the seed funding for Facebook after cashing out from PayPal. His investments now include Elon Musk's SpaceX, yes, he has since made up with Elon, Stripe, Airbnb, Asana, Spotify, Twilio, Lyft, Oculus, Credit Karma, ZocDoc, and dozens of other tech companies that have changed the world or are in the process of doing so. Despite the fact that he's on record routinely criticizing Silicon Valley for its lack of innovation. Today, he's a boogeyman to those on the left who see his involvement in free speech platform Rumble as evidence that even his investment strategy is moving to the far right and not just his political contributions. And many wonder if they go beyond speech to real world destruction of the political system. Take, for example, Palantir, a company that Teal was instrumental in funding and generating connections for lucrative contracts. Now, you might remember Palantir's involvement in hunting down undocumented migrants during the Trump years. As The Intercept wrote in 2017, quote, Palantir has never masked its ambitions, in particular the desire to sell its services to the U.S. government. The CIA itself was an early investor in the startup through InQtel, the agency's venture capital branch. But Palantir refuses to discuss or even name its government clientele, despite landing at least $1.2 billion in federal contracts since 2009, end quote. Some see this as evidence that Teal, through proxy investment Palantir, had designs on supporting some of Trump's most evil policies. But while Teal was certainly a vocal supporter of Trump, even snagging a primetime slot at the 2016 Republican convention, the fact is that Palantir did even better under Obama. It's also true that most of Teal's recommendations for hires as a member of Trump's transition team weren't chosen, and that Teal eventually pulled his support for Trump's reelection bid. Like I said, this dude's hard to pin down. As The Atlantic points out, quote, Teal's greatest startup hits share no particular industry theme, but most reflect this appetite for radical outsiderism, end quote. Another quick piece of information to file away for later, by the way, is the fact that Palantir's IPO filings showed that the company hadn't yet turned a profit by 2020, despite years of lucrative contracts, and hold on to that thought. Aside from his investments, which are a matter of public record and have won him accolades in financial circles, I find his backstory more illuminating. The outsider, the contrarian, self-made billionaire. These are compelling narratives that when matched with wealth, buy you access and a voice in the public square. But to accomplish what? To say what? In 2009, Thiel wrote, quote, I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible, lamenting that, quote, the vast increase in welfare beneficiaries and the extension of the franchise to women, two constituencies that are notoriously tough for libertarians, have rendered the notion of capitalist democracy into an oxymoron, end quote. This is where Thiel gets interesting later in life. If you can judge someone by the company they keep and the things they do, then it creates a devastating circumstantial picture of someone who is more than an opportunistic investor. People like Teal are characterized these days as incels when they're young, disassociated misogynists who live largely online and are incapable of relationships. Then there's the alt-right wing of the Republican Party that does things like, I don't know, storm the Capitol. 
We've got white Christian nationalists who are anti-immigration, xenophobic survivalists who want to take away bodily autonomy and give power to the states. And we have the billionaire libertarian tax evaders who support far-right candidates to clear a path for the groups above and their patrons to avoid taxes. In the center of this Venn diagram sits Peter Thiel. The brilliant Natasha Leonard wrote a piece for The Intercept last year that speaks to the formation of the new right. Here's an excerpt. Quote, now in our era of Trumpian reaction, we are seeing reports about a new, new right. Like the new rights that came before it, it's a loose constellation of self-identifying, anti-establishment, allegedly heterodox reactionaries. The newest of the rights is similarly fueled by disaffection with liberal progress myths and united by white supremacist backlash, this time with funding largely from billionaire Peter Thiel." End quote. In our politics, it shows up in the form of donations, but also candidate selection. And this is where Thiel has upped the ante compared to billionaire funders of the past. Candidates have always sought the approval and funding of billionaires and libertarians. But what's different about Thiel is he's literally constructing candidates from his likeness from the ground up, such as Blake Masters and J.D. Vance. These weren't just his hand-picked candidates that he personally funded, with Vance going on to secure a victory. They were both employees of his at one time. He's criticized the very concept of democracy, saying that majorities are dangerous. Just look at North Korea. That climate science isn't science. He thinks nationalism can be dangerous, but at least it's an antidote against globalization. Despite securing advanced degrees from one of the top universities in the country, he's vehemently opposed to higher education and even started a fund for college students with good ideas. The only thing that they have to do is drop out of college to get them. So let's rack up the inconsistencies that build this profile of the contrarian. Two advanced degrees from Stanford, but encourages students to drop out of college. He's a devout Christian who evades taxes and quotes Tolkien. He's a gay man who backs openly homophobic candidates like Blake Masters and wrote in his book, The Diversity Myth, that Stanford should seal its glory holes and that women are to blame for redefining coercion and seduction as rape. He routinely shits on California and he lives in California. Famously ousted Musk from PayPal when he was on vacation. Then he became an investor in SpaceX. He believes the government is evil and surveillance state is corrupt, but he co-founded Palantir with the CIA, and he relies on government contracts to make money. He took money from friends and family and bombed as a hedge fund only to start PayPal when he saw it as a way to bring down governments by replacing currency. As a white dude who thinks apartheid was a fine system, he sees no merit in the idea of privilege. A white dude from a family that literally made its money from engineering oil refineries, uranium mines, and strip mining. Supported their friendless child through not one, but two advanced degrees, only to watch him piss them away when he quit the legal profession, quit being a derivatives trader, and blew almost all of his friends and family's money in a hedge fund. A dude who took that remaining money and back to technology because he believed it could destabilize governments. Earned revenue from porn and gambling, looked the other way at money laundering and global fraud. Basically fucked over his business partner and never made a penny because he worked his contacts in the investment community to take on millions that he gave to customers to sign up for his free product. Then he took that money, hid it in a tax shelter, thereby abusing a system that was designed to help low to middle income earners. Peter Thiel failed as a lawyer, failed as a hedge fund manager, leveraged every ounce of his white privilege to invest in something that never turned a profit. Palantir didn't turn a profit, but its largest customer is the government, the very thing that Peter Thiel wants to destroy. SpaceX's largest customer, also the government, which Peter Thiel wants to destroy. He backed Trump because he wanted to tear down the wall of government institutions, then abandoned Trump when he didn't get any of the appointments that he wanted. Now he's trying to take over the government by installing hand-picked senators and backing myriad other big lie candidates. He shits all over Silicon Valley for its lack of innovation, yet he runs a fund that invests in Silicon Valley companies. He appears at conferences to talk about entrepreneurship, Christianity, libertarianism, and is even giving foreign policy speeches. He can quote philosophers and kings, probably hold his own against a grandmaster in chess. He's made a bloody fortune rolling the dice on ideas that have the ability to hasten the creative destruction of legacy industries and society. Peter Thiel 
is trying to hijack what's left of our democracy because democracy attempts to organize political and economic realism in a way that supports humanity and society. So of course Thiel doesn't get it. He's acquired the financial wherewithal to participate actively in the destruction of this very democracy for the very same ruthless reasons. He has a chip missing. And that would be almost fine, I suppose, if he left well enough alone, but he won't. He's not content being Howard Rourke. He wants to be John Galt. Peter Thiel is mad at the world because he doesn't fit into it. He's a petulant child with too much money. Pete's a nihilist who wants to eat the world, and we won't let him. Here endeth the lesson. I won't rehash how PayPal. I won't rehash how PayPal. PayPal. Blah, 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 blah.